Okay, hello class. We are starting today talking about pigeons and creoles. Um, and before uh, we start talking, I have a very interesting look um, at a pigeon. Um, this is uh, from the BBC, BBC Pigeon Radio. Um, so if you click on the link, the video that it shows or the recording that it shows um, isn't available. But if you click through, you can hear other pigeon uh, broadcast so we'll talk about what a pigeon is but um, you really get the sense and feel of a pigeon by listening to it and what it sounds like BBC Pigeon Minute All Nigerians way hook for Libya could begin come house from today Minister of Foreign Affairs Geoffrey Onyema lead team go Libya to reason how they could come out their people How many Nigerians fit we talk? Him saying are just over 5,000 for Cameroon, Prime Minister Philemon Yang don't open new African Union Continental Logistics Center for Douala. With Tori Persil Kadia Bongbe gets more. The center get 32 offices and the African country them go to use them for maintain peace and fight insecurity. North Korea don't agree hold official talks with South Korea. Are you saying next week they won't start? Yes, this is not the first talks in over two years as North Korea nuclear missile test the Vex world leader. Arsenal manager Anse Venga go pay £40,000 as fine as punishment for the way he vexed during Sunday match with West Brom. England Football Association say Venga go also get three match touchline ban. Tori for 7 p.m. Come join us online. bbc.com slash pigeon. So how much of that could you um, understand? How much of that was English? How much of that was accent in English? How much of that was um, maybe influence of another language? And so I think the BBC, um, they, well, in England in general, they have a large Ghana population, um, large Nigerian population. Uh, and so um, for, uh, this is very revolutionary. I just discovered this this year. But, you know, um, after a while they said, you know, maybe received pronunciation is, isn't the only way that we can address news broadcasts. We can also include, you know, this this new form of pidgin English, this accented form spoken by the um, immigrants or spoken by children immigrants or spoken by the community of lots of African uh, descendant um, nations. And so um, we have this kind of a form of media in which uh, maybe pidgin, if you um, talk about pigeon or, you know, some of you said that, um, you have like a, you know, a background where you're from Ghana. Um, some people would say that pigeon is, uh, quote unquote, uneducated. So it's very revolutionary that they would have, you know, a very, um, esteemed broadcast on the BBC completely in this language. Um, so you can check out more pigeon broadcasts here. This is an article, um, that I, saw last year and it was woman want throw away poo poo come trap for a window um and it's detailing this broadcast of this woman who uh, was on a date and um couldn't flush her poop so then she tried to throw it out the window so um like again you know we can talk about how this is relevant to english how this you know sounds very englishy sounds very accented englishy i wonder some ways in which pigeons are actually full-fledged languages themselves so we talk about pigeons and creoles. These are languages in contact, and they actually uh, shows a lot about how language is something that isn't set in stone. You notice from when you wrote on your discussion board posts about how there's new words created all the time, right? Um, well, there's also, you know, if you think about it, new language forms created all the time. Language is not something that's always stagnant. And so what happens when we create these new languages or what happens when we see a birth of a new language or what happens when um, people speak different languages, like, you know, and uh, they're very different, which which language holds out and how do they um, kind of mitigate the different tongues that they talk about. Okay, so um, a common phrase that a lot of people like to use um, is, is uh, lingua franca. Um, and this is a type of language that is spoken by people who maybe speak different languages as their native language, but they have a common tongue and so they talk in this common tongue. Uh, so it's a language that is adopted as a common language between speakers whose native languages are different. So currently we know that English is lingua franca of the world. How do we know that is because um, business, you know, lots of businesses, um, if you're going to do something in business, you would learn English or now I think now you would probably learn Mandarin. Um, language of the internet is English, right? And so 
Um, much of the world needs to rely on English uh, nowadays. And it's a very common misconception uh, that people, you know, don't need to know English or that a lot of immigrants move to the United States and don't want to speak English um, because English is something that's very coveted. Um, it is a lingua franca. Um, if two people don't know um, a single language, they'll resort back to English. Um, or it could just be something that's very cultural. So, for example, um, there's two professors in the in education department at UMBC. They're both Korean, South Korean, I should say. And, um, you know, I overheard them speaking in English to each other. And I asked them, you know, why do you speak in English to each other if um, you can both understand Korean? And, um, you know, they were like, well, you know, in Korean, there is some sort of power hierarchy where, you know, you might outrank, you know, she would outrank the other professor uh, or you're supposed to speak to a certain way in your elders. And so they just use English as this kind of um, language in order to uh, kind of be the, the, you know, the bridge um, when, you know, it's it's. Um, much better for their purposes to communicate in English rather than to use Korean, even though they both know it. So it's a lingua franca in a lot of ways other than just knowledge of this language. Um, French was also known as a lingua franca of diplomacy. I've had a lot of European students in the past, and they've always told me that, you know, they've had to learn French. So I had an Italian student who had to learn French, you know. And um, I asked her why. I said, well, you know, wouldn't you be better off learning English? And she said, well, yes, we learn English as well. But we also learned French because that was also known as a lingua franca of diplomacy. Um, and I think it is also the language, official language of the UN, but I'm not sure. And I think also the UN has many, many approved and official languages. But um, as far as diplomacy, as far as, you know, uh, European politics go, French is definitely a very popular language to learn. Um, in the past, Latin and Greek have been the lingua franca for the Roman Empire and for Christendom. And so Latin was very popular choice um, where I grew up in, uh, you know, in uh, North Carolina. Um, and a lot of that was because, you know, in order to read these biblical texts, you'd have to learn these languages. Um, and Yiddish was also known as a lingua franca for Jews. Um, Yiddish, um, I think maybe we'll talk about Yiddish during our written language uh, lecture, but Yiddish um, is, you know, originated in, in New York, and now um, now that New York is very much, you know, pockets of different communities now, um, a lot of them, a lot of the Yiddish speakers have moved out, um, but a lot of, um, so you'll find Yiddish mostly spoken by, like, old Jewish grandmothers who say that they want to schlep something somewhere, um, so, um, but, you know, th this, this is, you know, we'll talk about languages revitalization, but um, a lot of Jews are now taking on Yiddish as, um, you know, a way that they communicate with other Jews. Um, so how do lingua franca start? Well, it could start as a trade language. So East Africa is populated by lots of different languages. Some of you wrote in your discussion board posts that, um, you know, you speak English, but you also speak African languages and particular ones uh, according to your dialect. And um, this is very common, actually, to have a, a place that is very multilingual. Um, so, for example, Africans might learn Swahili um, as their second language and use it in the marketplace. Uh, so even in a very, very, very small place, they'll use um, one language, um, not even in like schools or at home, but even just like in the marketplace. Um, there also might be regional lingua franca. So we talked about Hindi and Urdu. They're the lingua francas of India and Pakistan. But in the city of Mysore, the language um, Canada is a lingua franca in the commercial center. Uh, so you need to learn multiple languages in order to thrive, right? You'll need to learn um, the official languages. You'll need to learn popular languages. But you, seem, you even need to learn certain languages in order to, you know, haggle something at the market. And so this is something that's very common. Uh, um, you know, all around the world. Some lingua francas are instituted as a government policy. So we talked about Chinese government and how they wanted Putonghua, which is the uh, Mandarin, uh, based on the Beijing dialect um, and the grammar um, of the northern Chinese dialects. And then the, the written language is, is based on the minority dialects. Um, but, you know, we talked about how in China, and a lot of people really can't understand their neighbors far away. So they needed 
the Chinese government needed a way, um, you know, to spread literacy. And so they did this by instituting uh, Mandarin Putonghua as their official language. Um, and so sometimes this can be, uh, rather than bottom-up, it could be a top-down measure. But what do you do if the languages and cultures are too widely separated for one language to function effectively as an orphan? In other words, what do you do if you no one speaks English or no one speaks French? Or you come into an area and um, you don't necessarily want to conquer them, but you want to kind of, you know, make trade with them or make relations with them. Uh, so you want to kind of get to know their language a little bit more. What do you do? Well, you form a pigeon. So this is the development of a language in contact. And so this a pigeon occurs when, you know, there isn't a major language that everyone speaks. And so it's kind of taking... Um, components of both languages together in this this kind of combination language and it originated from traders and missionaries um, because these are people who want to no, they do not want to force their language among you know among the people um, you know so they weren't conquerors they weren't like Columbus they didn't they didn't want to come and kind of control people and say now you have to speak my language they're more likely to say, okay, I want to trade with you. So, you know, maybe I can learn some words of your language. Maybe you can learn some words of my language and we can have a great deal. Or missionaries. Actually, linguistics as a, as a, uh, a field of study um, has a large, and still has a large contingent among missionaries. The greatest linguistic organization is SIL, uh, who do a lot of missionary work overseas. Because the greatest way to spread the word of God is to learn other people's languages and then translate them. Um, so it's going to be very hard to convert someone in English if they don't speak English. So it's better for them to speak, you know, to for, for missionaries to learn uh, native languages and, um, you know, try to carry out their mission that way. Um, I have a friend who's Cambodian and she says that one of her, you know, when she went back to Cambodia, she, uh, someone behind her in class was speaking this perfect Khmer, which is in the Cambodian language. She turned around and it was, you know, it was this white guy. And she was very pleasantly surprised, but he was a missionary. And um, he was a very, stu you know, very dutiful student. And so he did a great job of learning the language because that's, that's part of his mission. So again, it comes from this kind of built relationship that you want to have. Uh, with these two communities, and it's less so of like a domineering or oppressive language situation. So, um, I'm talking about the linguistic features of pigeons, and this kind of gives credence in how pigeons are actually a language. Um, so, here are some words of talk pigeon. So, talk pigeon literally means to talk pigeon, and it is the lingua franca of Papua New Guinea. So, what do you think the meanings of these words mean? Grass belong face, mouse grass. Grass on long top, long eye, on top long eye. Grass be long pisson, grass be long dog, grass no good. So, um, grass belong face, grass belong face. So the grass belonging to your face. Mouse grass, grass on top of your eye, grass belonging to a pigeon. Grass belonging to a dog and a grass no good. So the answers are um, grass belong to the face. So it's like the grass of your face would be a beard. The grass of your mouth would be a mustache. The grass on long top of your eye would be eyebrow. The grass belonging to a pigeon would be a bird's feather. The grass belonging to a dog is a dog's fur. And the grass no good is not bald, but it's actually a weed, but grass no good. So you can see that uh, one of the features of a pigeon is that it carries a lot of semantic burden, which means that one word can have many, many, many different meanings. Um, so grass, in this instance, can mean hair, right? Hair, uh, belong, you know, it could mean fur, like hair belonging to a bird, or hair belonging to a bird, or, you know, a dog, sorry, a dog and a bird. Um, but can also mean uh, grass itself, right? The grass is no good, which is a weed. So it's only through context that we can really figure out what these words mean and in, in the what the pigeon words mean. So um, development of a pigeon, it has to hit prolonged regular contact. It can't just be 
like a one-on-one -on -one instance. Um, it has to be something that's developed over time to where, um, you know, the missionaries would know part of the native languages and the native people would know part of the missionary languages. It needs to be a good need to communicate with them, right? So language has always been something that has developed out of a communicative need. And so if you don't have any need to communicate with them, you wouldn't really try. Um, so this is why the need for trade or the need for, you know, the spread of the word of God really helped to foster these pigeons. Uh, and it also requires the absence of a widespread accessible interlanguage, which, you know, would be English or French or, you know, would be these different, the two languages would have to be something that's very different from each other. So it's, it couldn't be something like Spanish or Portuguese, for instance. So, um, other instances of a lingua franca is that, um, so two or more language groups use their native language as the basis of the lingua franca. So the native language, um, mostly contributes to the syntax and some of the morphology. Uh, so it really helps with some of the grammar. So if the native language is a subject object verb language, then it would most likely use that syntax. Or if it uses certain morphological forms like, you know, past tense, if it um, inflects for past tense, it would use that morphology. But the, the lexical items, the vocabulary, mostly comes from the dominant language. Um, so a lot of you wrote that, you know, pigeons are probably something that's like uneducated people uh, talk. Or maybe you heard that when, you know, during the BBC clip that I paid, played for you. Um, but I think... It has this kind of like elementary, like uneducated feel because it sounds like a mixture of two languages. And so because it's not quote unquote pure, a lot of people like to, um, you know, discredit it and say that, oh, it's not, you know, it's trying to be English, but it's not English. So therefore, um, it's not good. Whereas um, I think that pigeons taken in their own right are really considered languages because of some of these linguistic features. So um, to give examples of a pigeon, this is an example of um, Chinook jargon or Chinook Wawa. This is the pigeon used in the Pacific Northwest um, and encompasses features from indigenous languages, so spoken by Native Americans at the time and English and French. And um, this very much sounds like if you've ever seen the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, uh, the Revenant, um, you know, they came from, uh, sorry, Leonardo DiCaprio plays a fur trader. And so most of these, um, this, this, uh, pigeon came from this need to trade furs with the locals. Um, but I would like you to watch this video. It's very, very, very short, but she just goes over some of the words in Chinook Wawa. Um, and so what words can you interpret? What words does she use in English? What words does she use um, that maybe have a more Native American feel, right? Um, so, you know, talk about what part, you know, what are some different key aspects that she uses from both languages. Other features of pigeons is that, it come, you know, as you saw with talk piece, piece in, they typically have a very small vocabulary. Um, so, for example, in Chinook jargon, Chinook Wawa, which is just, looked at muck muck means to eat but can also mean to drink and it can also mean any activity involving the mouth so it really would take um it would take the context in order to discover what the meaning of the word that you're trying to, to say similarly cameroonian pigeon pigeon spoken in cameroon a stick could mean a stick but it can also mean a tree and wake up could mean wake up but it can also mean to get up. So there's a lot of, um, which is lots of semantic ambiguity here because you're not really sure what's what. Um, it's kind of similar to, you know, the children's language. Like you don't know if a child sees a Cheerios or really wants Cheerios or what. And But um, as you notice with the BBC Pigeon, they are very, very, very fluent, right? It's it's not everyone is confused, even if it has a small vocabulary. Not They aren't very confused about what they're trying to say. They know exactly what they're trying to say. It's very fluent in this way. So to um, give you another example, this is talk piece in, so spoken in Papua New Guinea. 
Um, and so um, it's a whole video talking about different, you know, types of pigeon. Um, but the way that he interacts with the natives, um, consider the way that what you know, consider what they call women. Um, consider some of the words that you maybe um, are familiar with in English. Um, and maybe what are some um, Aboriginal or what are some local native words um, that combine or contribute to talk through them. So um, the pigeons have their own rules, their own vocabulary, grammar, and syntax. So this is how we know that they're a language. So we talk about languages as something that's uniquely human. It's not just a barrage of random words or random letters combined together. It has to have some sort of syntactical meaning. It has to have some sort of grammatical meaning. The languages are reduced to easily understood terms, and the nouns clearly don't have plurals. The verbs lack tense, person, or number. So it's kind of like if I said, I go to the store. I go store. I go store, right? Um, you can... You can obviously figure out if you're a native English speaker what I'm talking about, but you notice that I don't, you know, I didn't use, like, I went to the store, right? Or I would just say, I go store yesterday, and you would understand um, the meaning and the context of the sentence. So, again, this is, I think, why a lot of people think that is uneducated, um, because it, you know, doesn't inflect for a lot of things. Um, but I would argue that. Pigeons are very, very, very useful in their own right. So other examples, Korean, bamboo English. Um, this is also kind of racist, I think, or a little racial, I should say, um, because, um, you know, you could just say Korean English. You don't say bamboo, but whatever, Korean, bamboo English. Um, so reduplification is a linguistic process in which you take the same word and you, um, you multiply it and then... Uh, by, you know, you just have the same word over and over, but it changes the meaning of the word. So um, in American Sign Language, um, if you say, you know, food, I'm a sign for food, but if you do it twice, it means to eat. Uh, same thing here, talky-talky. So the person who is talky-talky is someone who speaks a lot, someone who is very gregarious. Um, and in Cameroon Pigeon English, the pronoun system does not show gender. Uh, he or she, or all cases in standard English. So um, it's very similar to Chinese in this regard, in which, you know, you don't really differentiate the gender he or she. But it doesn't mean it's not complex, and it doesn't mean that it's totally devoid of grammar or that's random. So Cameroon Pigeon English, um, they might have fewer prepositions than any of the languages that they are based on. Um, so, for example, in Cameroon Pigeon English, fo, the preposition fo, can mean to, or it could also mean at, or in, or for, or from. So, if I said, for example, give the book for me, that means give the book to me, right? Or do this one for me, a beg, which is do this one for me, please. Or the money day for table, or the money is on the table, right? So, you can see how fo as a preposition can be used for a lot of different things. So I always ask my students, what do I sound like when I am talking in this way? Give the book for me, do this one for me, a big, do money, day for table. And um, it sounds very much like African English, but it also sounds a lot like Champa. I sound like Champa. Um, and it sounds a lot like Caribbean Englishes. And we'll talk about later how lots of, there's lots of Caribbean influence with pigeons. Um, another example would be Chinese Pigeon English. So, of course, this came out of the trading uh, route in which a lot of European merchants wanted to trade with Chinese merchants on the Silk Road. Um, the only problem with this video, and this is the best video I could find on the internet, is that they decided to put like a, one of those triangle hats on the Chinese guy and one of the top hats on the European. And you really, I mean, I don't think that you need to have the hats there because I can kind of figure it out. But, and they're kind of superimposed too. It's very weird. But just ignore the racism in this video. And you can talk about, you know, what are some things that you see in their speech? What are some things that are very Chinesey? What are some things that are very Englishy? Especially for those of you who speak Chinese. So, Chinese speech in English, here's some features. 
uh, too muchy, so you notice that the guy says e a lot. Um, so that comes from English. So adding e is a very um, Chinese pigeon is pigeon Englishy way. Um, and I also think that's another reason why a lot of people think that you know these varieties aren't languages is they think that maybe you're trying to make fun of Chinese people. Um, sabi comes from saber Portuguese. Jos comes from juice. Portuguese forgot. So there's a lot of Portuguese influence, especially if you think about the history of um, trading with China and how Macau is uh, very much a Portuguese hub. hub, hub. Um, and then we also have forms in American speech that we, that comes from this Chinese pidgin English. To make do, long time no see, how come, to look see, no can do, where to, no go. It's all very, very um, common forms. There's also lots of Cantonese influence, like I said, E, to just demonstrate classifier nouns or to ind indicate uh, a number like that, demonstratives, right? You want chi, catchy, one PC, lawyer, you have to obtain a lawyer. This E, chop tea, what name was the name of this tea? Um, so Chinese Pigeon English is very close to California Pigeon English, but its morphological and syntactical features differ. Why do you think this is? Um, good, you know, a lot of good responses have been that, uh, you know, if you think about the migration of Cantonese influence, uh, Cantonese immigrants came to the United States, have more of a historical influence of coming to the United States more so than, uh, you know, California Chinese pidgin English. Um, but it could also be the fact that, uh, people who, um, before they came to California, a lot of immigrants also stopped in places like Hawaii. And as we talk about later, Hawaii is very multicultural and very multilingual. So that could definitely have an influence. Um, I will also note here that the Chinese speech in English, like the E or no can do or no la, this sounds very much like Singaporean English. So I don't talk about it a lot here, but Singaporean English has a, has, is, um, a very varied way of speaking. Um, and it has these kind of influences between like an Asian variety and English itself. And so I would definitely say that Sing Singlish, Singaporean English, um, was a, was a pigeon and now it's a Creole, which we'll talk about very soon. Stereotypical representations of CCP in the past. There was this play, The Chinese Must Go, in which they, um, tried to represent some parts of, California Chinese Pigeon English. So, for example, uh, oh, koi, China man, plenty of work, plenty of money, plenty to eat. White man, no work, no money, die, sabi. Right? So, they're, you know, they're playing on this kind of racist play. Um, but what, as a linguist perspective, you know, we just kind of ignore all of that and say, but what features are actually relevant? So, um, you know, some features are known uh, in CPE, Chinese Pigeon English. So, for example, sabi, we saw earlier, or the usage of e as a suffix, that was very common. But then also they would have, like, random things like um, like me ask him um, uh, resumptive he, like ting, he run. Use of down, like going down, one place down the river. And heap, meaning a lot, or really, like me heap, sabi, I will tell you heap lots. This is actually used a lot in Australian English, heap. Um, and down is used a lot in Southern English. So it's kind of like... In making this kind of barrage or this representation of Chinese Pigeon English, California Chinese Pigeon English, they just decided to lump all the accents together. Um, so I would say, you know, this is something that's very historically inaccurate, but um, it's very interesting to see the perspectives that people had towards pigeons um, and very negative. I mean, lots of negative attitudes towards pigeons, like. People have called it an unruly bastard jargon filled with nursery imbecilities, vulgarisms, and corruptions. The government of China forbid Chinese Pigeon English, which died out because they forbid it because they just, you know, it's not like Chinese, it's not like English, it's somewhere in the middle, so they don't like that. Um, Chinook jargon was no longer used, although it is having some sort of a comeback. Um, and then this is fine in Nigeria. Pigeons taking a heavy toll on the English. So a lot of people believe that pigeon um, 
if you're learning pidgin, you're not learning English English. Um, which is not true at all because you can learn different varieties such as, you know, African American English, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, knowing that actually helps to improve your English, if anything, because it's just another variety. Well, okay, to contrast that, there's positive attitudes about pigeons. And so this is pigeon, which is spoken in Hawaii. If you've ever been to Hawaii, please write in this question board and let me know. Um, and maybe some of you are in Hawaii right now. I wish I was because of this weather. But, um, you know, Hawaii's pigeon is something that um, a lot of people, you know, like in the negative attitudes have berated in the past. But now it's been something that's very accepted. Um, and I think, well, I know that it has a lot to do with tourism in Hawaii because Hawaii is something, you know, when you go to Hawaii, you want to think of it as like a distant land, you know, and so it has a different people and different customs and different language. And so language becomes a part of that commodity that people can sell. Um, and so there kind of been this revitalization of pigeon English as something that's that's like oh we're different you know uh, this is something that's Hawaiian um, which is very different when you think about the past and how they tried to basically get rid of pigeon altogether right so the benefits of a pigeon is that in areas of mutually unintelligible languages a pigeon can play a vital role in unifying cultures right so if you witness in the video between the tailor and um, the guy getting his suit you know they're they seem pretty close right and um, as you noted in your discussion boards, language is something that is, you know, most beneficial when it's used by a shared group. Um, so at UBC, Trevor Noah came last year, and Trevor Noah, uh, I was just, you know, thinking about and listening to his audiobook, where he talked about as a South African, as a mixed South African. One of the things that people, uh, well, a lot of people like would make judgments about him because, you know, he's mixed and this is a time of apartheid. But he said the one way that he can mitigate that was by speaking all these different languages. Because when people look at you and they, they assume something of you and you start speaking in the, you know, they, they have all these judgments um, in mind. But then as soon as you start speaking, the, you know, their language, they say, oh, okay, well, you might look different, but you're not that bad because you, we can understand each other. So it's okay. Um, and so you more or less said that in his audiobook, which I thought was very interesting, but you know, a pigeon kind of does that for people. It's kind of like this bridge that says, Hey, you're not forcing your language on me and I'm not, you know, um, trying to force my language on you. Instead, we're kind of working together to learn each other's languages, which I think is pretty neat. They're also very intensely useful. So an English pigeon, an English, okay, so a person who, learned, who knows English, if you know English fluently, then you can learn a pigeon in six months, right? Whereas some of you are learning Japanese, and that can take many, many, many years and decades even. Um, they reflect the creativity, the linguistic creativity of humans. And um, because there's so many different words, yeah, so there's different words that, that are very, uh, I think, illustrative that many English words aren't. So, for example, try to guess the following meanings of these words. Him, brother, belong me. Lamp, belong Jesus. Government, catch him, fella. Him, belly, all the time, burn. So, him, brother, belong me is a friend. Lamp, The lamp belonging to Jesus is son. The government, catch him, fella, is a police. And him, belly, all the time, burn is thirsty. Although, we don't know which thirsty he means, but he's thirsty. So these, these pigeon forms are very creative and they're very different than the forms that, you know, um, or they're very, they reflect a lot of creativity because, you know, you don't just have a single word for it. Just pigeons technically have a uh, very small vocabulary. So you kind of have to, you kind of have to, you know, um, pick and choose different words in order to form uh, a new sentence or a new word. And so it becomes very creative you know, how these different, um, how speakers of this pigeon might use different languages in their repertoire to form these words. So, also, how do pigeons compare to Broca's aphasia, children's language, Tarzan's language, so Tarzan says, like, me, Tarzan, you too. Genie's language, so Genie, we didn't talk about Genie in this class, but Genie was a squirrel 
um, who was locked away for 12 years. And so she was, before the critical period, um, couldn't learn a language and then after couldn't really form syntax, uh, syntactical language. How do pigeons compare to the language of a tel telegram? So like, you know, sending a message like, uh, get rid of your Christmas tree, stop, you know? And did English originate from a pigeon? So if um, if you studied up on English, the history of the English language, or know anything about English as a language, you know that it's kind of has these Germanic roots. Um, and so if you know Proto Germanic was a pigeon, these it came from these um, the sailors that would sail around and make uh, trades with different cultures. Then um, you know it be kind of. By the time it kind of sailed around to England, it kind of changed a little bit. Um, and so, yes, if you believe that English originated as a pigeon, then German's a pigeon, Dutch is a pigeon, and Yiddish all came from a pigeon. All languages came from a pigeon. Um, in the past, people have been, so they study, well, I don't know how they would study this, but they believe, evolutionary scholars believe, based on, I think, just like remains um, of food scraps maybe, that people in the past were very, very, very multilingual and knew a lot of different languages more so than we are um, because they had to interact and they had to make trades and they had to, um, you know, go on their seafaring adventures. So they really just had to communicate with so many different people. So what happens to a pigeon when it dies? And by dies, I mean it's adopted by everyone. In a community as native tongue. So it's no longer used as this kind of, um, at the beginning, as ad hoc form of communication between two people who don't have a shared language. It becomes a creole. So ironically, when a pigeon dies, it becomes so widespread that successive generations adopt it as its native language. Um, so a typical rule of thumb is that when children learn the language um, as their first language, it doesn't, it isn't a pigeon anymore. It becomes creole. So creoles are when a pigeon forms a mother tongue. So this is again, I think, from Hawaiian English, and so um, you can kind of, kind of go through this video and see if, if there's any words that uh, you know. I actually have a student one time who said that she knew the guy that produced this video, which was uh, very interesting. So creoles. So it's very um, important to know that creoles. You know, when a pigeon forms a, a, a creole, it's made by children. And that's important because the word creole comes from a child who was raised in a different household or a child of mixed ancestry. Um, when we think of creole, we think of Louisiana creole. We think of um, Beyonce, who said that she's, you know, her uh, her mom is, her dad's Alabama, her mom's Louisiana. So you mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. So she is very proud of her mixed heritage. And so this Creole, when we think of Creole, we think of the food. Uh, we think of people who have African, French, and Spanish descent and their culture. Um, so different Creoles have different dominant languages as their base. So Haitian Creole is based off the French. Jamaican Creole is based off the English. Gullah, spoken off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, is based off English. Louisiana Creole, based off of French. Chalkisin, um, based some of the Melanesian languages and some of English, spoken in Papua New Guinea, where over 700 languages are spoken. Um, so differences between pigeons and Creoles. Um, well, well, you know, I'll let you kind of figure it out, but... Um, you know, sometimes people would say pigeons are kind of this, this introductory, um, the language is still changing, whereas creoles are something that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more advanced. Um, as far as, you know, sometimes it's really hard to tell. So for example, Hawaiian pigeon is actually a creole because the, the kids speak it, right? Um, so a lot of Things are called Creole, Haitian Creole, um, but a lot of things are called Pigeon, like Talk Pigeon, Talk Pigeon, was actually Creole. 
So the Hawaiian Creole English, you know, compare this with the attitudes of pigeons seen earlier. And um, you kind of understand that people in Hawaii are very, very proud now, I would say, very, very proud of their language. Uh, so with this water, he cow cow him to me. Uh, right, so the processes are different. It's not always clear whether we're talking about pigeon or creole. Talky sins, sometimes called a pigeon, sometimes a creole. So it's Hawaii, Hawaiian pigeon English or Hawaiian creole English. But the children are what makes a difference. Um, other differences is the pigeon is usually learned alongside of the language, but the creoles are the language. So everyone speaks creole at home. Creoles are also far richer or more complex than pigeons. Um, because the children help out with this. So how is it that children can create creoles from only hearing pigeons? Well, as you remember from the language acquisition PowerPoint, that children are innately very ingenious. They're very, very, very good at creating languages all by themselves. Children have innate grammatical capabilities and immensely enrich the pigeon so that it becomes a full-fledged language. So... As an adult, it's very hard for us to, um, some adults, it's very hard for some adults, I should say, to learn a language. But children, it's very, very, very easy for them to learn a language and to acquire a language. And so because of this, children have this unique ability to know of a language, to learn a language, to hear a language, and kind of develop it a little bit further, kind of develop this complex, uh, systematic, grammatical um, context of a language and also be able to teach it to other people and so there's this case of Nicodoguan sign language and uh, you should watch this documentary a because it's very informative and b because it's narrated by Liam Neeson from Taken um, which I don't know why he would narrate this video but I also don't know why he would do Taken 3 so um, but this is a case in which um, you know, after some war, there was a, a, a civil war in Nicaragua, and after the civil war, everyone went to schools, and um, the deaf kids, uh, Nicaraguan deaf kids, went to another school in which they taught them by uh, reading lips, and it didn't really work, because that's the worst way to teach um, a deaf student. Um, so they decided, the kids themselves uh, decided to form these mimicas, which are these, like, hand signs, uh, and, you know, one person would bring a hand sign that they learned from home, and another person would bring a hand sign, and it's kind of like, you know, how on fleek, everyone on the discussion board wrote on fleek, um, that became popular and very viral. This also, you know, these different hand signs become very viral, and the kids actually themselves, they create this language, and it's very inspiring. But well, it's birth to a new language, right? Um, the younger children took on the pigeon signing, and they made it more complex. More proof, if you believe in Chomsky's theory, if you're a rationalist, if you believe that language is hardwired, is something that's in your genes, right? Everyone is born with this capacity to learn a language, and that's why these kids have this unique ability to create a new language and develop it further. And now there are only 3,000 signers, so that's great. So talking about Creoles, Creoles, um, we talk about Caribbean Creoles, uh, specifically, they arose on slave plantations in which Africans of many different tribes could communicate only to the pigeon spoken on the plantation. And so um, Creoles also arose because some, a lot of the slave masters really wanted to, um, they didn't want their slaves rebelling or revolting. So they tried to pick different slaves from different areas so they couldn't form a shared communication. Um, and then there was also interaction between the slaves and the slave owners themselves. So if you speak French, I think that you should watch this video and kind of understand the similarities between Haitian Creole and French. Gullah and Geechee are also uh, spoken off of the African slaves off of the islands of, Co of Georgia and South Africa. And so this either originated from slaves developing their own Creole language or speakers knowing Guinea Coast Creole English, a West African pigeon, before they were enslaved. And that's how it developed uh, on these islands. Why do you think this Creole formed differently than the sentence in the rest of the U.S.? 
Well, if you know anything about geography, people who are um, speaking languages on islands tend to be more isolated than other, or less prone to language change than other uh, language groups. So there have also been similarities between Gullah and Geechee to African American English. So for example, um, Gullah has uh, the recent past, a uh, help them, which is akin to AAE for I done helped them. So that's like you helped someone recently. I done helped them, right? Or in Gullah, a been helped them. I've been helping them in AAE. So in person who speaks AAE says I've been helping them. That means I've been helping them for a long time. Versus a done help them versus I been help them and AE means I helped them out a long time ago and usually follows with like I ain't helping them out anymore. But help can also occur with other language as well as interdental stopping such as uh, that for that. So you can see lots of similarities here between the Caribbeans, Caribbean Creoles, and African American English. Bayesian Creole, the Creole in bar spoken in Barbados. Um, popularized by uh, one of the top selling artists, Rihanna. So Bayesian Creole is a West African substrate and an English superstrate with close ties to Gullah, Belizean, and Guyanese Creoles. So uh, when Rihanna first came out, she had this pawn to replay. And so pawn to replay means put on the replay. And this is her um, instance of. Um, using her Barbados Creole, her Bayesian Creole. And the one thing that's very particular to Rihanna is that she always puts this in her song. She always uses her Bayesian identity, her Barbados identity in her songs. She's never been apologetic about it. And I think that's part of the reason why she's very successful. So some other terms of Bayesian English, Gaudalize, word final T, stop, stop for start. Interdentals, the and the, have merged with T and D. So instead of them and thing, they'll say dem and ting. So ting is actually very popular in Beijing English, Caribbean English, Jamaican English, Jamaican Patois. Um, and I've noticed recently that this is uh, kind of caught on. Uh, whereas, for example, Drake would use something, he would use ting in his songs, but he's actually Canadian. So you can maybe tell me in your discussion board why. Drake decides to use ting instead of thing. Zero copular, your wife in the backseat of my brand new foreign car instead of your wife is in the backseat of my brand new foreign car. Something very, very, very common. Uh, similarities between uh, Beijing English and AAE. And this is what I was talking about. A lot of people like to bash her because they think that she's speaking gibberish. Um, but she's actually not speaking gibberish. She's speaking her native Patois. It's not. It's not really Jamaican. It's Bayesian, but that's okay. This article tried. Um, so this is the work video. So try to interpret her use of Bayesian English, and how would you translate it into standard American English? Um, so this is what a lot of people said that she was talking like gibberish about, right? Well, she's actually not talking gibberish. She's speaking her native dialect, her native Creole. Um, and so speaking of Jamaican patois. Uh, there's lots of linguistic linguistic features of this Creole. So, for example, you can use A as an equal to a verb. So, for example, um, Mia de teacher. I am the teacher. You can use the locative verb de. We de a London or we de in a London. Or copular absence. Me old now. I am old now. Um. So this is from one of my favorite movies of all time, Cool Runnings, which is on Netflix. Um, so if you have any time to kill, you should definitely watch it. But, um, and interestingly enough, I found that in France, Cool Runnings is actually called Rasta Rockets. But anyway, so notice what does Nichols the reading? What does the reading emphasize about the use of Creoles? Why do people use Creoles? And if you watch this movie, you'll understand that using Creoles Creoles will never go away. A lot of people think it's unintelligent. A lot of people think, you know, it's um, uneducated and, you know, it's used by poor class or whatever. But Creoles will never go away because it's inherently a part of people's identity. And so he says, if you talk Jamaican, you walk Jamaican, 
you know, you are Jamaican, you is Jamaican, then you must bobsled Jamaican because that's just part of who you are. Um, Trinidad and Tobago. And so these are all variations. This Trinidad and Tobago has a lot of uh, influence, a lot of influence from Indian populations and Indian immigrants and Indian uh, migrants. So, for example, Aya, Bakcha, Bowetna, Chupid, Cha. That, that is you, go, fete, lime. So try to, you know, under, try to guess what these, meaning, the meanings of these words are. All yeah is all of you people or everyone. Back chat is a response to a question. But wait not, but wait a time. Chupid, stupid, can ya, can't. Dat, that, that is you, is that you? Yo, girl, fete, party, I think it's French. Lime, when a small group of people engage in a hangout. So Creole is also very useful. They provide evidence of language change. They provide evidence of how language is very structured and how it's layered and it takes time, but really it's the kids that really help out in this regard. And it may take several generations in an area in which a pigeon is spoken for it to become a Creole. Um, so pigeons, you know, they're kind of highly variable. They either kind of die out because of it's very unpopular. The government, you know, hates that the people use it so they for, forbid it or something or over time it could be, turn into a creole uh, so for example talk piece has a long history um but now it's you know it's a creole and it's a, one of the official languages of Papua new guinea so speaking of african-american english where did it originate from well, there's two prevailing theories of african-american english uh theory one is that there's a creolist view so in times of slavery you trace back to its roots to parts of South Africa brought to the New World in the 17th century by Africans who were enslaved. And like I said, they tried to, the slave owners tried to separate the slaves from different uh, tribes so they wouldn't speak in a similar language and revolt. Or Anglicist or dialectologist's view is that African American English came from communication between slaves and slave owners and that African American English isn't really traced back from Africa. It's more English. So Creole's method is that, or Creole's view is that AAE is more African. English is more, it's that AAE is more American. So the Creole's view, um, like I said, they were forced to develop a common form of communication. After a while, it became Creole, principal language. We have proof through Jamaican Creoles, Creoles in Africa, Gullah, and it makes sense because all of these languages you know, are African because they're very similar. Like you saw that Bayesian Creole is very similar to AEE. You saw that Gullah Geechee was very similar to AEE. And so, you know, maybe there's no coincidence in that these African-American English is African because it has its roots from Africa. And so these slaves, they had to communicate with each other. And so they kind of created this, this pigeon that created, that formed into a Creole. And over time, um, the languages reconverges with one of the standard English Englishes. So Jamaican Creole, maybe, you know, it's, it was formed by the Africans, um, slaves, but then af over time it became more like English as, become it, as it became more standardized or English became the more dominant force in Jamaica. So here's the Creolist model. So Earlier Englishes creates modern English and regional varieties such as Southern English, um, but African languages really form into all these different forms. So Jamaican, Patois, and Gullah, and Geechee, and AE are very similar. They're, they're sisters. The dialectologist theory is very different. So this is pioneered by my mentor, uh, Walt Wolfram. He's like a, wrote, written over 200 articles and books over about African American English. And I studied with him, so he's my thesis advisor. But he says that actually African American English is more American than it is African. And um, so it's kind of just like Southern English. Because if you think about it, AE has a lot of similarities with Southern English. Um, and so it's more American than it is African. So what do you think? Um, do you think AE is nothing more than the variant of Southern English or is it drastically different? 
So they compare the um, Walt compared the slave recordings of uh, the time, and they com and they compared that with the speakers, um, the white speakers, and he said that it was the same. Um, so there could be some evidence for that. There also could be evidence that it could be both, right? Because if you think about it, language is something that is always altering depending on who you talk to. So it could have its origins in Africa, but um, mixed in with English, uh, mixed back in with African, other African languages, other Caribbean languages, you know, mixing back in with Southern English. It really could be a big, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the either. It could be both. So discussion questions for this week. Number one, discuss why people may think pigeons and creoles are not considered full-fledged languages. What are some examples in which you would counter this viewpoint? And I guess if you want to argue for it, you could do that as well. Number two, is African American English sounding more like standard English? Is it converging? Or is it sounding more different? Is it diverging? Why do you believe this? Provide some examples. Other than that, I will see you in a discussion board.